Michael Henderson, and take it away. Give us, please, an update on the good work going on in Deer Falcons on the Seward Peninsula. Great, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Yeah. All right, everybody see my screen good? Looks beautiful. Perfect. All right, well, I appreciate everybody coming out. I know these are uh, very strange times. I'm also at my home where I've been working uh, the last, you know, eight months or whatever since uh, February. Um, I appreciate everybody coming out, taking an interest in raptor conservation, and in particular tonight, the Jeer Falcon. They are a very impressive bird. And just one more thing that really makes studying wildlife on the Seward Peninsula a, a special thing. Uh, I, Gay did a really good job uh, introducing me, but my name is Michael Henderson. I work for the Peregrine Fund. I did uh, my master's work at Boise State University, where I uh, have the privilege to work with deer falcons outside of Nome on the Seward Peninsula. And so I've been working on this project since 2016. So the location and the bird uh, mean a great deal to me at this point. I also wanted to note that this project is a collaborative effort between um, the Peregrine Fund and Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Our primary collaborator with the agency shown here is Travis Booms. Uh, he's been studying deer falcons since the late 90s and working on the Seward Peninsula since around 2010, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, the contribution of Travis and Fish and Game are completely essential to our project, so I always like to note their contribution right in the beginning. Uh, but on to the real star of today, which is deer falcons. I'm sorry that Tinsel, the, the real life deer falcon, couldn't be here today, but hopefully some cool pictures will have to suffice until next year when hopefully we can, can get her back in the classroom again. So deer falcons are the largest falcon in the world. Females are larger than males and can weigh up to about four and a half pounds, wingspan about four feet wide. Um, although they look quite bulky in flight, it does, doesn't seem to slow them down much. Um, sorry. It doesn't seem to slow them down much. Um, peregrine falcons, which are their smaller cousin, are considered the fastest animal in the world, reaching speeds of about 200 miles per hour from a high stoop. Um, although they're considered the fastest animal in the world, deer falcons are, off, uh, are oftentimes thought to be faster than peregrine falcons in a straight line powered flight. Um, their large size also allows them to take really large prey, sometimes even up to the size of a crane. Uh, their size and tenacity makes them a favorite of falconers and birders alike. And many people spend a lot of time and money to get to know them every year just to see these birds. Typically, deer falcon nests on, uh, nest on cliff ledges, often on stick nests made by other species, including ravens, rough-legged hawks, and golden eagles. They do, however, occasionally nest on bare ledges, trees, and other man-made structures. Around Nome, there are four species, and to a certain extent, uh, peregrine falcons as well, compete for nesting sites, some of which can be seen from the road system. Deer falcons are monogamous, meaning they typically breed in pairs, and both pairs perform parental duties, including hunting, nest defense, incubating, and brooding although males tend to do less brooding and more hunting early in the season, in the breeding season. They typically lay three to four um, eggs per clutch and only lay one clutch per year. Um, so if anything happens to their young, uh, such as a, a big storm wipes out their nestlings or their nests collapse, that's gonna be it for their year. Um, around Nome, they typically lay eggs uh, sometime around April and they and nestlings fledge around July. Um, it's really impressive to see these birds breeding early in the season during spring when snowfall can actually completely bury the adult incubating the eggs. They'll stay tight on those eggs and um, you know, do, do their best to, to, to incubate during the harsh weather. It used to be thought that there were different subspecies for jeer falcons, and you can see this in a lot of books that are currently out now. Um, this was likely due to uh, drastic differences in their physical appearance. Um, after some more recent genetic analysis, jeer falcons are now considered a monotypic species. That is a species that doesn't have any subspecies. There are also are no distinct color morphs, although they are frequently referred to that way. 
Rather, deer falcon coloration occurs on a continuum from those very dark birds, almost to, almost to be black, um, all the way to the iconic white coloration. All of these colorations do exist on the, on the Seward Peninsula. As a fact, both of these pictures were taken on the Seward Peninsula. Uh, but by far the most common variety is uh, the intermediate gray. Deer falcons really are the quintessential Arctic raptor. They breed farther north than any other diurnal raptor, only rivaled by uh, the snowy owl. Breeding and evolving under harsh conditions has fine-tuned deer falcons to thrive in the Arctic, too far north for most raptor species to survive. What I think makes these birds truly special is that most population of deer falcons tend to be non-migratory, spending all winter in the Arctic and subarctic. Uh, hatch, hatch year birds are occasionally seen at lower latitudes, making it as far south as Idaho and Montana, but breeding age adults typically remain somewhat near territories all year round, likely because they start breeding so early in the spring, they have to remain relatively close. I find it amazing they're able to survive all winter with very little light, very few light hours, the cold temperatures with very few prey species available. Due to the dramatic changes that occur between the Arctic summer and winter, the deer falcon diet varies greatly throughout the year. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the most critical species for prey are going to be ptarmigan. Around Nome, there's two species of ptarmigan, which are willow ptarmigan up in the top panel and rock ptarmigan in the bottom panel. Uh, they're particularly important in winter because ptarmigan are one of the few species that are available during this time. They're also very important in the early spring, again, because they're one of the few species. Um, and they help the deer falcons reach a body condition that, uh, that is needed in order to breed. Uh, so their diet during the winter is very specialized, but during the short summer months, they incorporate many other species, including ground squirrels, shore, shorebirds, songbirds, and seabirds. No, oh, there's all the examples. As I stated before, deer falcons only breed in the Arctic and the subarctic. If we take a look at a deer falcon distribution map, uh, we can look at those breeding areas, which are those marked by purple and orange in this figure. And then we can see that most of that breeding is occurring above 55 degrees latitude. The weather extremes and ruggedness of this habitat has somewhat buffered deer falcons from a lot of the human caused disturbances. But even though deer falcons breed far from the largest contributors of greenhouse gases, uh, they are being exposed to some of the harshest effects of global climate change. Here I show a figure uh, from IPCC that shows predicted temperature increases in the relatively short and long term. And if we draw that same 55 degree latitude line, we can see that the greatest changes in temperature are occurring and will continue to occur in those northern latitudes, uh, overlapping with the deer falcon circumpolar distribution. The process by which the north, it, uh, the north is warming faster is termed polar amplification. This is in part due to the ice albedo feedback mechanism. As anyone who's ever worn a dark shirt on a hot day can tell you that dark colors absorb more heat than light colors. Thus ice, which is lightly colored, reflects a lot of, uh, a lot of sunlight, which in turn melts more ice, which then absorbs less sunlight. And it's just basically a self-feeding loop that feeds itself and can actually kind of run away and make dramatic changes in the temperature. Accompanying these temperatures is increased precipitation. If we take a look at that same 55 degree latitude line, we again see that the most dramatic changes uh, are occurring within the Gear Falcon circumpolar range. And it's not just accumulate, uh, accumulative rain throughout the season, but also more intense storms that can cause issues. These rain events can affect deer falcons indirectly by forcing their prey to take shelter, leaving them unavailable for hunting deer falcons, or directly by killing nestlings in the nest because they lack the physiological mechanisms that would allow them to survive such a storm. Just to highlight the effect that precipitation can have on wildlife, there was a study in Greenland published in 2019 that demonstrated during an abnormally heavy snow year which resulted in near ecosystem-wide reproductive failure. From 27 to 2018, they saw reproductive failures from everything from plants to birds to muskox, with just a very small subset shown here. 
Resulting from these climatic changes, the Arctic is experiencing dramatic landscape changes, namely the increase in size and distribution of shrubs on the tundra landscape, driven by earlier and warmer springs. Uh, this is affecting the distribution of wildlife and disrupting ecosystem functions. Hold on, sorry. Technical issue here. Back on. Okay. Warmer temperatures. No worries. What's that? No worries. Okay. All right. We're moving forward then. All right. Warmer temperatures and changing ecology is exposing Arctic wildlife to novel diseases for which they lack immunity. Changing local disease ecology is often due to distribution of vectors like mosquitoes, ranges of hosts like waterfowl, and calmer weather, which allows pathogens to complete their life cycles farther north than was traditionally possible. These phenomena, uh, among others, solidify climate change as a top conservation concern within the Arctic. Which brings us to the question of how do we study the effects of climate change when they're happening to an entire system? Well, we can study all the species and their interactions. While this would provide great data, Remote field work is expensive and logistically challenging, leaving this uh, type of research unrealistic. Another good option is to focus research on indicator or sentinel species. Uh, these are species that can reveal many types of uh, disruptions within their ecosystem. These species tend to be uh, specialized for a particular habitat. Because they're so fine-tuned for that particular environment, they will be most affected by changes to that environment. And top predators are also great indicator species because they rely on the health of the lower uh, tiers of their food web. So anything that would happen to say the plant system would affect the herbivores would affect the top predators. Uh, because deer falcons uh, check both of these boxes, they're both a specialist and a top predator. They've been identified as an effective sentinel species for the Arctic by the Circumpolar Biodiversity Monitoring Pro Program. There are many ways that an ecosystem can be disrupted, but many of them should reveal themselves through in-depth research of deer falcons. Further, this research needs to be performed by experienced organizations and individuals, which brings us to the Peregrine Fund, which recently celebrated 50 years of conservation of birds of prey from around the world. Uh, perhaps our most famous conservation success from the Peregrine Fund was the recovery of the peregrine falcon uh, in North America through helping to get the pesticide DDT banned in conjunction with captive breeding and releasing, the Peregrine Fund helped prevent the extirpation or the local extinction of peregrine falcons in North America. The Peregrine Fund became keenly aware of threats of climate change on deer falcons and they started the Deer Falcon and Tundra Conservation Program. This project is a little different than some of the other projects of the Peregrine Fund in that the deer falcon is not currently considered threatened or endangered, but they are considered to be among the most threatened bird species to climate change. Because of this, it's critical for us to better understand uh, this understudied species to mitigate the approaching conservation concerns. Unlike other conservation concerns, climate change will not be reversed quickly or easily, so we need to be prepared with the knowledge in order to protect the vulnerable Arctic ecosystem as well as its quintessential raptor. We also aim to collaborate with robust research organizations to increase the impact of our research. In addition to Alaska Department of Fish and Game, we're also uh, collaborating with Cornell University, the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and the Arctic Council for Conservation of Arctic Flora and Fauna, just to name a few. And all of this work ultimately is focused on preserving the deer falcon uh, and the truly special ecosystem that it calls home. To study the effects of climate change and better understand the biology of deer falcons, the uh, Peregrine Fund selected Alaska's Seward Peninsula uh, to study these birds. This is a great place to study deer falcons because there is a relatively robust deer falcon population. And ultimately, the road system is a really great tool for us to actually be able to access some of these nests because it, these road systems are pretty rare to find in deer falcon habitat. Also, recent ed evidence has suggested that this population of deer falcons may be on the decline, although we are doing a lot of work right now 
in order to do more robust analysis to better understand and address this concern. The Seward Peninsula may be more vulnerable than other populations because it is sitting at the southern extent of the Geofalcon breeding range. In addition to this trend, local temperatures have been rather extreme lately. Uh, here we see uh, temperatures in Nome, Alaska in 2019 with above average temperatures in red and below average temperatures in blue, and it paints a fairly intense picture throughout the year. There's also been a corresponding decrease in the amount of sea ice that's accumulating throughout the Bering Sea, which can have serious cascading effects. And when I was just talking to Gay before we started this presentation, it sounds like uh, there's also a bit of an ice issue on the Chukchi Sea as well. So the big question is, what, what are we doing about all this? Well, we have a lot of goals on the project, but most of them can be boiled down to one of four main objectives. The first being consistent raptor monitoring to keep a finger on the pulse of the population and identify any behavioral changes that are occurring. Twice a year, along with Alaska Department of Fish and Game, we survey about 600 sites to determine how many birds are breeding, where, and how successfully they're able to do so. These surveys focus on the entire raptor assemblage, uh, so that provides data on about 40 gear falcons, 50 rough-legged hawks, and 20 golden eagles uh, on average per year. You may be able to see in this photo, luckily we're on a, our own individual screen, so it might actually be easier to see, uh, that there is a gray gear falcon incubating. Uh, you can actually see an orange egg sticking out of the front of the gear falcon. Uh, this is a fairly typical view of what we see in the helicopter as we're flying by these sites. For nests that are accessible from the road system, we also ban nestlings with a color band. These have an alphanumeric code on them and allow us to identify an individual from a distance with either a spawning scope or a camera. We also collect feathers and blood samples, which provide us important data on nestling health, as well as the genetic sample. Importantly, we've installed 70 motion activated cameras and occupied deer falcon set and sites that have yielded some invaluable information. To install these cameras, we repel down cliffs and mount them directly on cliffs adjacent to the nest. During this process, safety is our utmost priority, including the safety of adult birds and their young. In addition to our extreme caution, we also have uh, extensive experience and training to keep everybody safe during these processes. From these cameras, we are able to get a very precise measurement of diet throughout the entire brood ring period. Over the last six years, we've recorded over 7,000 prey items from more than 2 million photos. And that number is actually a bit, a bit higher now. We can also determine how many eggs hatched and the date that this occurred, which is the level of detail few studies are able to obtain. We're also able to determine how many nestlings successfully fledged and if and when mortality has occurred. And we're also able to quantify adult nest attendance behaviors by using a photo that's taken every half an hour as a sampling method. It can be extremely powerful having this detailed look at breeding attempts, including surprises that we didn't even know we were looking for. Uh, like in 2014, when we recorded a partial nest collapse, which honestly isn't uncommon, these nests do fall occasionally and sometimes they have a breeding pair in them. Uh, but what was really unique this, in this particular instance is that the adult picked up the five day old nestling in its beak and flew it to a nearby nest that was about five meters away. Uh, this was the first time this has been recorded for any raptor, and uh, this result got published in 2015. Another interesting scenario was when we recorded a crested offlet as a prey item. Uh, this, again, was the first time it's ever been demonstrated as a prey item for deer falcons. What was interesting is this nest was more than 100 kilometers from the ocean, um, and the crested offlet is, is a seabird um, and has only been observed that far inland four times ever. Um, so very interesting, not really clear whether or not the crested auklet was in too far inland or the gear falcon flew all the way to the ocean to get the crested auklet, but an interesting finding nonetheless, uh, and this was published in 2016. Our second objective is to learn the dietary habits and the importance of prey species throughout the breeding season for these gear falcons. During the 2014 and 2015 seasons, uh, we recorded 40 different prey species from 15 different families 
but by far the two most important prey species were ptarmigan and Arctic ground squirrels. Using cameras, we were able to determine that studies that have previously used prey remains were underrepresenting ground squirrels and thus the importance of jeer falcons were underestimated. We also found that early in the seasons, jeer falcons tend to eat much more ptarmigan, which corresponds to the, their courtship period, the ptarmigan's courtship period. This is a time period where in particular, the male ptarmigans are out in the open. They stick out because they're white on a brown landscape and they're calling and making all kinds of noise trying to attract females, uh, which makes them likely more vulnerable to depredation by jeer falcons. <clears throat> as the uh, as the season progresses and those ptarmigan start uh, spending more time in the willows where they're unavailable to the jeer falcon, the jeer falcon seems to switch to uh, more ground squirrels uh, in the later part of the breeding season. Uh, this work was also published in 2019. Uh, we also have another paper that is uh, due to be published in March, and it's regarding the species and sex con uh, composition of ptarmigan killed by breeding jeer falcons. Because there's two species of ptarmigan in our study area, we aim to determine whether jeer falcons are prefer preferentially selecting for either species or if they're simply just exploiting the more locally abundant uh, species. We found that when areas around jeer falcon sites better match the habitat preferences of rock ptarmigan, more rock ptarmigan were in fact consumed, suggesting that jeer falcons likely preyed upon whichever species they had the most access to. Interestingly, we also found that during the time frame that female ptarmigan are incubating, so they tend to incubate on very concealed, hard to find nests, uh, male ptarmigan were much more likely to be depredated during that time period. That shows just how breeding strategies and timing can affect risks, risk of depredation. Uh, a third paper that was actually just recently published rega uh, regarding a new method of determining jeer falcon diet. Dietary stable isotopes is a laboratory and statistical technique that quantifies animal diet from just a blood sample. To use this method, we need something called a trophic discrimination factor uh, which is specific to jeer falcons. Traditionally, this method required housing an animal for an extended period of time, feeding them the same prey item and taking many blood samples in order to get this factor. But what we did instead was use our Cheryl cameras and what's called a Bayesian statistical framework, which is essentially just you know a fancy statistical um, ideology. And uh, so we compared our method to other methods and ours was considerably more accurate and avoids a lot of those logistical difficulties with the traditional method with having to house all those animals, um, et cetera. So ultimately we were able to create a powerful tool for jeer falcon biologists to help quantify diet from just a blood sample, which was, should hopefully ease some logistical limitations of dietary studies. And we hope that it encourages some standardization so we can better compare our research to other research throughout the world. We've also started to look at how jeer falcon diet affects nestling health and how this change throughout, changes throughout the breeding season. If we take a look at this graph, we see that on the y-axis, so the, the one on the left-hand side that goes up and down, uh, we see nestling health, so unhealthy healthy individuals on the bottom, healthy individuals at the top, and the, the x-axis has uh, how specialized their diet is with very specialized diet, so a few species on the left, and more species, more of a generalized diet on the right-hand side. Um, if we focus in on the green line, those are the birds that are breeding earliest, and we see that they are the healthiest when they focus primarily on less species, which is gonna be uh, primarily ptarmigan. Uh, conversely, if we look at late breeders, which is gonna be that red line, uh, these breeders are too late to enjoy abundant ptarmigan because they've already started going um, you know, into the willows and they're harder to hunt. Uh, these late breeders have to incorporate additional species in order to increase the health of their nestlings, but ultimately they still never quite reach the level of health that uh, those early breeding ptarmigan specialist jeer falcons have. So we're getting a good idea of what they eat. Well, we don't know a ton about whether they're selecting for these prey species or if they're just taking what's most readily available. 
we kind of started getting into this with the ptarmigan, but we wanted to expand this out to look at all, all of the prey species. So in 2019, we hired a prey crew, a crew of technicians to go out every morning really early um, and, and perform intensive prey surveys. They were looking for uh, shorebirds, songbirds, Arctic ground squirrels and other uh, small mammals. And of course, both species of ptarmigan. By recording the location of the prey species and determining the type of habitat that each prey is associated with, we hope to estimate prey availability for each gyro falcon pair and determine uh, which habitat characteristics are important for gyro falcons uh, ability to breed. Uh, this project is ongoing, but so far the survey has been able to, we've been able to survey 468 individual points in which we've counted about just under 6,800 birds. I, we hope that this project is gonna be a great contribution to our understanding of gyro falcons in Alaska. Um, this research is now getting picked up by our newest graduate student, Michaela Gustafson. Uh, she's at Boise State University, and so you may see her around Nome uh, in the next few years. We're also aiming to figure out what characteristics in the gyro falcon habitat are better suited uh, for those breeding gyro falcons. We published a paper back in 2019 that demonstrated that gyro falcons breed in a non-random distribution pattern, which essentially just means they're not just going out on the landscape and breeding anywhere. They are in fact selecting for something, uh, which, which signals that uh, there are certain areas that better support breeding gyro falcons than others. This paper also attempted to uh, better understand how these gyro falcon occupancy rates function uh, with how they vary with ptarmigan habitat within their territories. Uh, this yielded some ambiguous results, so we're not really sure what's going on yet, uh, but we're ultimately hoping that those prey surveys that we're going to do are going to help us uh, better understand which prey habitats these gyro falcons are selecting for and how they affect their ability to breed. We've also investigated how properties of nest sites affect gyro falcon reproduction particularly how much protection they provide during bad weather. Gyro falcon nests can vary greatly in the protections they provide to breeding birds. For example, here we see a nice protected nest with an overhang that's keeping these nestlings dry during this rainstorm. And it has nice lateral protections on either side of it that's gonna protect these nestlings from the wind. We can compare that with this more exposed site that enjoys none of those protections and an adult that's fully exposed to the harsh Arctic climate. It, it's possible that gyro falcon nests vary so much because they typically breed in nests built by other species. For example, here on the left, we see a raven uh, building on a stick nest in the winter of 2018. And then on the right, we see a gyro falcon pair breeding in that exact same nest the subsequent summer in 2019. Um, so likely these gyro falcons pushed this raven out of the nest after the raven had built it, or built on it at least. So we found that nestlings were significantly more likely to survive when they were in a more protected nest. And that adults in protected sites were able to leave the nest earlier in the season and more frequently, lowering their cost of breeding and allowing them more time to forage and hunt for um, additional prey. As a result of this research, in addition to all the existing literature, I think uh, future conservation action should consider protective nesting sites when um, identifying those areas that are best suited for gyro falcon breeding. Uh, this paper is also due to be published in March. And lastly, we're looking at diseases. This is a brand new aspect of our research that we uh, you know, just started designing this year. And I, for one, am particularly excited about this research. It's a collaborative effort with obviously Alaska Department of Fish and Game again, and Cornell University's College of Veterinary Medicine. And we'll be looking at um, any, uh, any diseases that we, can, that we think about for Alaskan gyr falcons. Uh, this is an exciting new avenue of research because novel pathogens could become a substantial conservation concern in the Arctic, and they are really not well understood right now. Further, as many falconers could tell you, Gyrofalcons are particularly susceptible to novel diseases. Um, 
So they are probably a very good species to study diseases in since they will elicit negative responses to them. Um, we'll be testing for diseases like avian malaria and influenza along with a whole suite of others. Uh, we will test archival blood samples from the Seward Peninsula and the YK Delta, uh, collected from 2004 until now to see how the, how the risk of exposure has changed over time and with various climate variables. And we'll also test how dietary choices affect disease exposure by collecting gerfalcon samples from the Seward Peninsula where they eat primarily resident species and Cold Bay where they primarily are eating waterfowl. For the next couple of years, we will be trapping free flying jeer falcons in order to accomplish this study. Uh, this fall, we completed a short pilot effort in order to test how efficiently we can trap jeer falcons. We ended up catching six jeer falcons, which admittedly doesn't sound like much to many people, but it was actually a resounding success in our eyes. Uh, not only are jeer falcons a difficult species to trap, they're rare. Um, but it was successful to us because not only did we uh, not only did we trap six adults or, or six free flying birds, uh, we landed on a trapping method that we felt we feel really good about moving forward, and we were able to successfully get all the samples we wanted from the birds that we were able to trap. These samples have been shipped to Cornell University, and we're expecting results back any day now. There was also a cool article that was published in National Geographic about jeer falcons and our project specifically. If you want to check it out, you can, uh, it's still, it's still live right now. Uh, you can just Google National Geographic and jeer falcons and it should come up no problem. Uh, this is a great opportunity to introduce a wide audience to jeer falcons as honestly most people do not get the opportunity to see these birds in the wild. Because these are crazy times, I thought I would give everybody an, an idea of how COVID-19 has affected our field work as uh, it has affected everybody else. Um, as everybody in Nome likely knows, there were varying travel restrictions to Nome and the state of Alaska. And ultimately we decided that the safety of residents and our employees outweighed our need to collect the typical data this year. So we didn't go to Nome for all summer. We, uh, I stayed home, I worked from home all season, basically focusing on trying to get work published and other administrative tasks. We did, however, have a very small group of people, just two of us, go to Nome while COVID numbers were low in the fall. Um, and thankfully testing in Nome was very efficient and we all tested negative multiple times before traveling to Nome and while we were there. Um, I was actually very impressed with how, how efficient and, and well-designed the the testing went when we were there. We were able to get test results, you know, before the end of the day. It was it was nice. Um, but for now, uh, we're still hoping to be back to normal next summer. But we're obviously having to play it by ear a bit because things are, of course, unpredictable right now. Um, so up in the air next year, hoping for a typical season. And with that, I like to highlight the importance of being proactive with conservation, especially when it comes to climate change. The research and understanding that we get today uh, can really make a big difference for the conservation we want to uh, accomplish tomorrow. Um, and so this project has a lot of organizations to thank. Here's all of our funding organizations. Um, but in particular, the two big ones are the Peregrine Fund and Alaska Department of Fish and Game. And there's also a lot of people we have to think, uh, thank, um, starting with John Earthman, who has helped us out in countless ways helped us get the project started um, and has helped us with logistics and has been a, a great guy to be around. Um, his daughter, Ava, also helped us in the field in 2019. And she was a, a, great, a great help out in the field. We also have David Anderson, who's a Paragon Fund employee and the director of this program. Uh, again, Travis Booms with Fish and Game. Graduate students like Bryce Robinson, Devin Johnson, uh, Peter Benty, who laid the groundwork for this project and has an amazing data set we can work with and has been a great help for every one of us. Also, all of the technicians and volunteers that have helped along the way with this project. Um, and I would normally go to 
questions, but I actually have a short video since I figured uh, you guys missed out on tinsel this year that maybe a, a video might uh, help soften the blow a little bit. So hopefully you guys can see this video. It's, uh, it's about a minute long. Feel, feel free, Michael, to tell us what we're seeing. On okay, some yeah, I mean, this is, uh, you know, food. This is, this is me throwing the rope down the cliff. I'm about to rappel down into this nest right here. Some nestlings over there on the left-hand side. This is how we install those nest cameras with a drill. We actually drill holes in it, install it. Here's Ava applying a uh, color band, putting back some nestlings after we banded them and collected samples. There's a kind of bird's eye view of our helicopter surveys. And that's just me releasing uh, one of the birds we caught this fall. Thank you, awesome images. And I think with that, if anybody has questions, I can uh, do my best to answer them. All right, so let's see if you, um, well, first off, thank you so much for your presentation. I have to say, the Peregrine Fund has the most gorgeous, um, or you, whoever does your pictures, it's the most gorgeous presentation, sort of spellbinding. Um, so thank you. And I don't know if people can use the chat and um, give give Michael Henderson some love there on, um, on his presentation. And I thank you so much for bringing the presentation back to Nome. Um, I'm sorry we're not at Northwest Campus, but hopefully next year we'll be we'll be back there. So we'll hope for that, and um, we'll look forward to meeting. Um, is it Michaela? Michaela, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you. So let's see if you stop sharing. I think people can actually see you better. Okay. And um, and you're getting some thank yous in the in the chat. Um. I'll open it up. Does anyone have questions for Michael Henderson? I know I do, but I'll wait. Let others jump in. You have on the chat, do you have a way to measure your effects on the birds? Um, so we've looked at um, how long it takes them to return to the nest. Since we have those nest cameras um, on the cliff site, we're able to look at how long it takes them to come back. Um, usually they come back honestly, within a few minutes, particularly if it's early in the season. Um, as nestlings get older, they do, in fact, uh, they might take a little longer to come back, but those nestlings are able to sit on a cliff ledge a lot longer without any issues. Um, there's been plenty of research that shows, uh, you know, taking small amount of blood samples. So we're not allowed to take any more than 1% of a bird's body weight in blood, um, and we don't come anywhere near that. We're way under that number. Um, so there's really no expectation of why we would be having a negative impact on these birds, um, but it's something we're always trying to be careful of. Um, if a bird is maybe not looking to be in the best health, um, we usually leave it alone. We won't take samples from a bird that we feel like is in subpar health. Um, you know, if weather conditions aren't perfect, if it's too cold, too rainy, anything like that, we're going to get out of there as, as soon as, you know, as soon as the weather changes or anything like that. So we do everything we can. Um, we have not done a major systematic check, I guess, on that. Um, you all, thank you. And gotten um, another comment. Michael, you forgot to mention you caught two birders with your decoys this fall. Hey, what you, happened? Uh, you were identifying them real well. <laughs> I had some decoys so out. And uh, I was I was hidden in the blind, and they didn't they didn't see my blind. <laughs> so they they thought they were real birds. I think so. Only only for a very short period of time, though. Well done. Um, any known pattern to where they hang out in winter? Just I anywhere honestly, where Darmigan are. Probably wherever Darmigan are. Um, we have had some cameras up in the winter, and they do periodically come back to nesting sites. Um, they tend to hang out there. They roost there when the snow level is really high. Um, so presumably they're staying relatively close to their breeding sites. Um, but 
like you said, I would imagine they're following the ptarmigan to a certain extent because they're uh, those ptarmigan are in their flocks in the winter. So wherever those birds go, I imagine the deer falcons follow. Um, and also the the hatch year birds, the birds that were just hatched that year, they kind of go everywhere. Um, there's been papers showing them going over to Russia. Um, they obviously go south towards uh, Canada and the continental U.S. So the the young birds kind of scatter from from what best we can tell. And you have another question in the chat. Thank you for an awesome presentation. Great photos. Can you tell us a little more about your graph with the unhealthy versus healthy breeders? Were they considered unhealthy because they were late breeders or because they were generalists or something else? Uh, that was based on a couple different body measurements. So um, kind of a fancier statistic thing, but essentially it was based on their body weight and their body size relative to their age. Um, so, you know, you have expectations of how big a 25 day old nestling should be. Um, and if they're below weight, they would consider more unhealthy. If they're above weight, they're considered, uh, sorry. If, if they're below weight, they're considered unhealthy. If they're above weight, they're considered healthy. Hopefully that answered that. And thank you, because, you know, I really appreciated the, the take home for me was that it, it's best to be, if you're a deer falcon on the Seward Peninsula, it's best to be an early specialist. Is that right? Yeah, I think you'll so. Be, I think it's definitely, a fat bird. definitely helps. Yeah, those ptarmigan are easy picking out there when they're out in the open like that. Do you, um, do you ever see them kill and consume ravens? I often wonder, that's a personal question because I often wonder about that. Um, they're both together all winter. Do you yeah, ever I've, see ne I've never seen it. They definitely harass each other. Um, they'll, sure. they'll hit each that's other. Um, I've never seen one personally actually depredate, kill a, a raven and eat it. No, I mean, that's a, the, the raven's a big bird. I imagine that's a, a bit of a threat would be my guess, um, but I've never seen it. Mutual respect, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Um, Peter Benty has a question. Do you have first emergence date for ground squirrels and elapsed time to when they become dominant prey? Uh, so we don't have emergence date data. Um, I typically see them when I get here in May They're, or get to Nome in May. Um, they're usually already out. Um, and when they become the dominant prey, we certainly have that in the data. Off the top of my head, I'm not going to be able to give you a super precise date. Um, but I mean, it's, it, you know, late June, middle, late June-ish is when they become the, the dominant prey over ptarmigan. Um, and yeah, Peter, I'm happy to give you better numbers than that, uh, but I just don't have them off the top of my head. Sorry. You're, you're muted, Gay. Hopefully you didn't hear me yelling at my dog earlier. But no. is the audience having trouble unmuting to ask the question in, in a person? I'm just noting that's a lot of questions on the chat. Um, we have one from another question or comment from the iPhone, Rafaela. So she's in Utgiagovic slash Barrow. And she says, northward limit nesting sites, ptarmigan, and Koktovic, a possible breeding site. Rafaela, I don't know if you mean that that's a possible breeding site for ptarmigan or a possible breeding site for deer falcon or how that's... No, uh, this Rafaela, I, I was curious you know. about, since it is uh, such a, you know, a Northern species, right? And so uh, my, I was curious since it can handle the Seward Peninsula. So my question is then why are we, you know, not seeing them appear? So I thought, okay, one of it is we don't have the cliff structures that, you know, you guys, that the Seward Peninsula has for breeding. And we, you know, we have limited time. Again, you always have to go inland. But Kaktovik is actually a site where I think you could, you know, in vicinity find cliffs as well as find a lot of ptarmigan. So I was just curious about the expansion potential of the gear falcons. And I'm just not aware of that on the North Slope, we have gear falcons. That was my question. Sorry for being unclear. Typing is strenuous. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, and if so it helps, if it helps, Michael, Koktovik is in the eastern Beaufort Sea, so it's um, it's really almost on the Canadian border, about ninety miles west of the Canadian border. And the Brooks Range is actually curving up towards it, so it's within 
uh, 20 something miles, 30 miles. Okay. Of the yeah, coast. I mean, I don't know that I have a, a super detailed answer there. Um, I know that there are deer falcons in the Brooks range. Um, how many and, and where exactly they land throughout Alaska, I, I don't know that I have the, the expertise to nail that down at the moment. Um, but I am aware that they are on, uh, they are on the, the north slope of the Brooks Range. Um, and I would guess that uh, having cliff sites that are available would be a limiting factor. Um, and just in general, they're a difficult species to find. Um, they, they don't make themselves well known, it seems like. Um, so I guess that's kind of the, the best answer I have, sorry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so yeah, that's great, thank you. This is Peter Bente, and I did survey work on the North Slope. Is my voice coming through? Yes. Yes, it's good to okay. hear you. Um, so in the 1970s and 1980s, I had a lot of survey work in Anwar. And uh, on the very coastal front of the ocean, Beaufort Sea, there are dewline stations, and there are raven nest structures in some of the dewline uh, facilities, and we did detect falcons in those raven nests. So they do occur all the way out to the coastline, but typically they're on the north front of the Brooks Range, so that's quite a distance from Kakpilik. Thank you, Peter. Thank I'll, you I'll very much. I'm in there. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Very, very useful. Thank you. Peter, do you know where, if Rafaela had more interest in that, do you know where would be the easiest available place to get the information on those sites? Uh, let's see, the work was done as part of uh, Northwest Gas Line and Arctic Gas, which was a, a gas proposal to take Prudhoe Bay gas over to Northwest Territories. So that's Arctic Gas Limited and Northwest Gas Line, which was, uh, that was in the 1980s. I could try to look for a more discreet reference, but that's where that information was housed. Great, well, thanks, Peter. Thank you. Um, there's a comment from Galaxy Tab A. Also great that your US six. I'm not sure what that refers to, or if that's something bird talk. No. Nope. Um, Gay, can you hear me? This is Polly. My name didn't oh. come off. Oh, hi, and, Polly. And it got sent by mistake, but I just wanted to compliment the speaker on um, analyzing old samples and. Um, you know, knowing how generous Peter's been with his data, that you guys can go back and, and play off of those um, old numbers and tie them all in. That's, I always like it when people, you know, keep pulling things together as they move forward. So thanks. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a, a fantastic data set that's uh, going to be mined for many, many years to come. Yippee. Well, good. Well, I hope that means we get you back again, Michael Henderson. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. I see that um, Gnome Nugget is in the, um, or I'm sorry, KNOM Radio is is in the audience too. So I appreciate you coming because I think we'll get, you'll people will be able to hear about um, the good work and learn something maybe new about your falcons in the communities where we can't, they can't, couldn't join us tonight because of the divide. So thank you so much for helping us out with that. Any other questions? Um, for Michael Henderson. I'm just checking the chat. I don't want to miss anybody. All right. Well, thank you so much.